Now I will introduce our special speaker from uh, Basel. Is Basel is right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basel. So are you for originally from Basel? I'm, I'm not from Basel. I'm um, I'm Spanish from Barcelona, actually. Oh, wow. So, so yeah. Do you like soccer? Or <laughs> not really. Not really. But yeah. yeah, I mean, if I have to support one team, I would say Barcelona. <laughs> not Real Madrid, is it? Is it <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love Barcelona too. Till, you know, Messi was there. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah uh, Marta is joining us from uh, Roche, uh, Switzerland, Basel. And, and she is currently leading development of deep learning group focus on generative adversarial networks, GAN, and their applications in healthcare. I'm really quite interested in the topic. In the past, she, also, she has also worked on different pro projects in the field of NLP to speed up clinical trials. I'm really curious about your experience in that. Are you gonna talk about that a little bit maybe? Um, how um, you expand that in clinical trials? How you speed it up? So is that also in the Roche or some other place you work? Yes, at Roche, yes. Uh, we have some teams working on NLP only. Um, did, did, it, did it work? You, did you speed up of, the clinical trials or not? Of course, by automat automatizing processes, you actually speed up uh, research and get faster, more efficient results, right? So, so that's speeding up clinical trials by oh, using, cool. yeah. <laughs> that's nice. So she's currently one young world ambassador for Roche. So maybe you can talk about this one a little bit to One Young World Ambassador. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the One Young World is um, an institution for sustainability. And it's basically a gathering or a network of, of uh, people that are working in big companies or big institutions, it could also be universities, that are working towards a sustainability goal. And so I'm using uh, machine learning to actually achieve sustainability goals. So my, my goal in one of my projects is to actually achieve fairness in our data sets. Because I don't know if you've had any sessions on this, but sometimes machine learnings can, be, can not be fair if we use the wrong data sets. And so, yes, I'm trying to develop models to understand and increase awareness of this fairness in our data and in our machine learning models. Yeah, I think it will be fair if you diversify the data. Yes, yes, so, there is. So that's that's uh, my my little contribution to the problem. That's nice. This is a good one. I like that uh, one young world ambassador. That's nice. <laughs> And she has a master's in health data science and MRS in neuroscience at University College London. So you have a yes. year in neuroscience training. That's nice. Yes, yes. So it's fantastic to have her. She has a diverse background and we cannot wait to listen to her uh, talk today. Um, I will share my screen. Sure. Mm. Okay, one second. Lost we got a great now. audience, actually. So, <laughs> thank so you all is, for being yeah, here today. That's good. Yes. So, let me share this. Okay. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. We Good. Can. So, well, thank you for the long and nice introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today to give this talk. And I wanted to talk today about uh, how to generate synthetic data with GANs. And so I'm very happy to tell you that we will start about uh, talking about what are generative adversarial networks how do they work and where we can apply them. 
I will go through some of the coolest applications of GANs that you can use in your personal projects or in business scenarios. And I, have, I hope to touch different domains, although I will be a bit biased towards the healthcare sector because this is uh, where I studied and where I work. And finally, I would like to tell you about why I think that we need synthetic data now. And I wanted to start uh, having a little fun and I wanted to start by playing a little game. So can you tell me which one is a real person and which one is not? That's a good one. I will just say neither of them. <laughs> <laughs> What does the rest of the people think? Okay. Well, good. just let's get the word from people. That's what they yes. say. What do you think? <laughs> so everyone says oh. both are fake. Someone says two is real, one is real, one one not. Yeah. So that means that uh, so obviously one of them is real, and people don't know which one. <laughs> Great. That's, it works. That's <laughs> That, that's most, what I was hoping. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but Amazing. most says, uh, almost two is real. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two is real, right? Okay. But so says, actually, both are fake. <laughs> oh, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So these images are actually generated with a type of deep learning model that is called Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN which allow us to generate synthetic, but really realistic data, just like these two images here. So the question is, for the, since they are fake, can mm -hmm. we use their pictures in uh, marketing purposes or do they belong to some computer or, uh, had, you know, IP on that? Do you know about Well, that? you should check uh, with the owners of the real data set, <laughs> of okay. course. Of course, um, if they let you do generate this synthetic data, then you can use it because it's not actually the real data. It, and it's a guarantee of privacy, but yeah, it's a difficult topic. Yeah. But yeah, in general, these, these images can be used, uh, uh, they are public. I will share the link later. Um, it's actually called, this person does not exist. And it's a website where you can get uh, images of fake people that don't exist in this world yeah so, i i use good. this one before for my presentation ah. purposes okay. that's why I'm asking. <laughs> so they so use I, I, I can share it so every time you click that website it shows different person yes yes <laughs> yeah go ahead please yeah so this is my image <laughs> generated by a gun and a i gun. know it is real so <laughs> Which one is real? <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe all the whole conversation is, is not real. Maybe you're all AI. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so uh, basically, again, um, this, type, this type of deep learning model that allows us to generate these images um, is composed by two neural networks that are trained simultaneously. And so there is a generator that is able to generate new samples and a discriminator that is able to tell whether an, a sample is real or fake. And so when trained simultaneously, both get better at doing their jobs. So we can get a really realistic picture like the one that you can see here. Another common analogy, which I love, is the one of the art forger and the art inspector. And in this example, we have an art forger, the generator, which tries to forge paintings, and an art inspector, the discriminator, which tries to detect imitations of paintings. And so the art inspector and the art forger are constantly trying to outsmart each other because the better the art forger is at creating imitations of paintings, the better the art inspe inspector needs to be at distinguishing real paintings from imitations. And this is how GANs learn, basically. And let's dive a little bit more on the more formal definition of how GANs work. A GAN is trained by an adversarial process in which we simultaneously train two neural networks, this generative and this discriminator. 
uh, the generative model can generate new data instances by looking at the data distribution. And a discriminative model that estim uh, can estimate the probability that a sample is real or not. And is therefore able to discriminate between real or synthetic data. So more formally, given a set of data, data instances X and a set of labels Y, a generative model captures the joint probability X and Y by modeling the data distribution, which basically tells you how likely a given example is. And on the other hand, the discriminative model captures the conditional probability Y given X by drawing a line in the data space. This basically tells you the probability that a label applies to an instance, or in other wor words, like you can see here, that a handwritten zero is actually a zero. So when both networks are trained simultaneously, both get better at doing their jobs. This learning can happen through back propagation. And the, the loss derived from the output of the discriminator is sent back to the generator, which uses this feedback to update its weights. And so there are many different ways to assess the quality of the generated data sets. Uh, however, I would like to um, classify them into, I th which I think are the most two important categories, similarity metrics and machine learning performance. And so a good way to assess the quality of the synthetic data set is to calculate its dis distance to the real data set. For example, we could look at the mean or standard deviation or any other aggregate statistic and compare it with, between the data sets. Or we could even use a distance function between images. Analyzing machine learning performance means to use the real data set and the synthetic data set for the same machine learning model and assess the different difference in performance. If the performance changes a lot when we are using the synthetic data set, maybe the synthetic data set is not really useful. And so GANs can be used for a myriad of applications that can be really cool. So let's look into the coolest ones. The first cool application that you have already seen is uh, phase generation. With a big enough data set, we should be able to generate images of people that don't really exist. And so maybe now you're thinking, why do I need that? Um, that's a bit silly to do, right? But it's the purpose. But start thinking about it. So can we generate faces for marketing purposes, like you said, or maybe for games? or even for creating a character in a movie. So AI and in particular GANs have changed the world of Im image editing and manipulation. And so one of the biggest breakthroughs I think is was Photoshop 22.0, um, which now comes with a new addition called neural filters that are built with GANs actually. And so neural filters allow the users for deeper edits, such as the ones that you can see here. You can change the subject's age or facial expression. You can amplify or reduce feelings, even feelings like joy or anger, or um, remove specific features like glasses or the birth. In the field of image processing and editing, GANs have also proved to be really good at improving the resolution of images. And this would definitely improve the quality of our models, especially if we use real data, because many, many times this data that we are using is of really low quality. GANs are also a solution to improve image restoration and reconstruction. So, Imagine that you take some pictures from a fantastic trip and the person that took the picture put the finger in front of the camera. So can you imagine if we could actually restore this picture and remove this finger? Like, of course, this sounds a bit fantastic and maybe you think it's a bit useless, but for now, it could. this is definitely beneficial for improving the quality of our images. So style, style transfer was definitely a breakthrough in the evolution of GANs. 
Image style transfer allows us to apply the style of one image onto another image while keeping the output realistic, just like these images here. For example, we can transform a zebra into a horse in seconds, or we can generate paintings with the style of different famous artists. So for example, here you can you could paint the Golden Bridge with the style of Edvard Munch, the painter who or the artist who painted the scream. As you can imagine, style transfer is widely used for image filters in any platform or social media platform. If we think about it, um, I can stop thinking about the many applications of style transfer. So for example, the easiest one that comes to mind is to generate art because we could transfer the style of wine painter into another painting and get a novel painting that we had never seen. But let's say that we imagine that we develop a, a GAN that is really good for audio. So do you think we could actually create songs from different singers? Another application, really, really interesting application of GANs is text to image translation. This allows us to generate realistic images based on a text. These models have, of course, the added complexity of having too much words to images. But as you can see here, they already are doing a pretty good job at it. So this application can be really useful for designers or marketing departments in order to get inspiration from the variety of outputs of GANs or to even generate quick designs from sketches like these ones. It could also help us, for example, uh, to illustrate visually a book or even better for us to build our PowerPoints with cool images that actually speak for themselves. So GANs were proposed by Ian Godfellow and some colleagues in 2014 and have improved really fast since. In the latest years, significant attention has been given to GANs from all different industries. And this includes healthcare, finance, arts, media and manufacturing and many others. This has led to the development of many GAN architectures over time and their performance have increased a lot. And so recently, GANs have also been adapted to actually take different types of data that not only include images, but also tabular data, text, audio, video, and like electronic health records, for example. Although I feel that GANs have been developed to be used more for images at the moment, like I can imagine the incredible things that we could do when GANs are better developed for double our data. So as I told you before, I'm a neuroscientist and health data scientist, and my goal is to contribute in some way to improving healthcare worldwide. And so for this reason, I continuously uh, strive to learn new data science and machine learning techniques that help us accelerate medical research. And so I wanted to share with you some of the coolest applications of GANs using medical data that I've come across recently. In the field of image processing, GANs have also achieved great success when applied to medical images. Image generation and segmentation are some of the key applications of GANs in healthcare. Having a sufficient amount of high quality data is crucial for building high performance algorithms in, in any domain. However, medical image acquisition and annotation is incredibly timely and costly, and it makes it very difficult for medical researchers to acquire sufficient labeled data sets to train them, their machine learning models. And so GANs can provide a powerful solution to the lack of data in medical imaging. And so in, in this example, we see synthetic images of human embryo cells that could have been obtained during cell development processes. These synthetic images were later used to facilitate the training and evaluation of machine learning models for embryo image processing tasks. 
GANs can also provide a solution to the challenges of medical image segmentation. Image segmentation is used to identify regions of interest in a medical image, such as the structural details of different organs or tissues, or to identify tumors. And so, for example, image segmentation can help researchers and doctors assess tumor growth and evaluate brain atrophy, which is a common biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. So here you can see that cycle GAN actually achieved a similar performance to the expert's performance in segmenting the kidney. In current clinical practice, multiple imaging modalities are available for different patient populations. Some imaging modalities are more popular than others, and usually it's linked to costs or uh, availability of these machines. And these added to the difficulties in collecting medical images, em emphasizes the need to develop methods that allow researchers to transfer images from one imaging modality to the other. And so in the same way that cell transfer allowed us to transform zebras to horses, researchers here were able to transform MRI images to CT scan images with great quality. While most applications of GANs in healthcare have been developed in the field of medical imaging so far, there has been an increasing focus in generating discrete medical data. Most efforts are focused in using GANs for augmenting tabular data sets, such as with um, CD GAN, and for generating synthetic data sets to improve protection of patient privacy. GANs have brought high expectations in the analysis of electronic health records and including also um, unstructured data, such as text. So here we have you have some links that you can later uh, check if you want to learn more about the cool applications of GANs in the medical domain. So so far, we've seen some cool applications of GANs for improving the quality of our images or for image editing. We've also seen how to apply these capabilities in the medical domain. And, but I hope you understand that these applications can be translated to any of the domains that you're interested in. So if you work in a big company like me that doesn't really have a strong focus on images, you might be wondering how can you apply the potential of GANs? And so I want to tell you now a bit about the two biggest challenge that, challenges that companies are facing right now the lack of data and data privacy issues. So as you might know, modern machine learning models um, such as deep neural networks may have billions of parameters and require massive labeled training data sets, which are many times, most of the times not available. Sometimes, some types of data such as medical data are difficult to obtain, are very costly, and or sometimes there is no easy way to, uh, to acquire this data, such as with medical gadgets. And also, also because of privacy concerns. GANs could be a solution to exploit the power of the very valuable data that we already have available. With GANs, we could augment the size of our data sets by learning from the data that we already have, and also by adding some variation to this data. And this will lead to better and more generalizable ML models. AI trends are moving towards a data-centric approach in which the protagonists are not models anymore, but data. As ML scientists, if we want to build models with high performance, that, that doesn't mean only high accuracy, but also outputs that are generalizable and basically are of high quality. For this, we need more and better data, and we need to put a stronger focus on understanding the underlying distributions of the data that we are using. Many of the datasets that we work with have unequal class distributions. This is many times due to the data collection process. 
So the performance of ML models is severely hindered when trained on imbalanced data sets. Since a model is not exposed to sufficient samples of the minority classes during training, and therefore the models show poor testing performance. While resampling techniques and some traditional data augmentation techniques are popular to tackle this problem, GANs could add additional value since they can not only help us in increasing the representation of the minority class in the data set, but they also add certain variation to the data. Data privacy is one of the major roadblocks in research. In recent years, we've seen a huge increase in the amount of ML code that has been open sourced to contribute to ML research. But this becomes way more complex when talking about data that contains sensitive and private information because it cannot be freely shared. This happens with financial data, with medical data, or also with data from social media. You, I'm sure you've heard a lot about recently. And so there are traditionally data anonymization techniques that have been used, but they do not seem to be very useful for training ML models and some um, have some, some risk of data leakage. Some alternatives such as encryption models could be valid, but there are a, a lot of concerns that they could lead to data breaches due to um, novel hacking attacks. And so also there is federated learning, which is an inter interesting alternative. Although it re relies on a cloud infrastructure that is complex, it, it needs to be available in both ends. And so sometimes this is very difficult and challenging. With GANs, we could actually generate synthetic data that retains the underlying statistical distributions of the original data, but does not rely uh, and th that doesn't rely on, on masking or, or omitting the original data. And so doing this, we can have a strong privacy guarantee um, that sensitive data is not being disclosed. The key consists here on finding a good trade-off between lowering the quality of the synthetic data set and adding variation to this data and making it private to make sure that no sensitive data can be leaked. Data availability and data privacy issues are strongly linked with the amount of open source data that we can use. Open data enables collaboration and strongly benefits research. Because at the end, if we don't have data, we can get valuable insights for accelerating research. And we cannot uh, do research for finding medicines or for optimizing food supply chains or any research project that you can imagine. And similarly, I'm sure that most of you or some of you have participated in a hackathon or a data challenge, anything that's related to educational purposes related to machine learning. And these activities are a very great and efficient way to learn about data science or machine learning. And I actually uh, recommend you to attend, attend some of them if you haven't done, done it. Um, but however, you receive some data that many times is sensitive. And so usually what institutions do is that they give you a subset of this data or a data set that resembles the real data. So I think by using GANs, we could generate a synthetic data set that could be more valuable for this purpose. The synthetic data sets uh, would, could be also very valuable for testing purposes. So many times um, in our jobs, we need to analyze a data set, but the data sharing process takes a long time. And we are really curious to understand how does this data set look and what are the main characteristics of this data set. And so what we could do is to actually um, explore a synthetic data set that is representative of the real one. And so for example, let, let's imagine another scenario. You have your own startup and you have built a product um, to improve recommendations on the shopping websites that you like. And so to build this product, you might need some data, right? To validate your algorithms. 
So it would be great if you could find a synthetic data set that resembles the original data set, but it's not the real one. It could, it could be a good starting point. So in summary, using GANs to generate synthetic private data sets could be a huge step forward in machine learning research as it would make data sets more easily accessible, allowing us to train our models with more and more diverse data and ultimately benefiting research. And so we've reached the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Of course, feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you want to discuss more, if you have want to share your thoughts but now uh, i'm sure we have some time for q a thank you okay i will answer okay let me see maybe i can share the Said here. So, why do you need GANs for image segmentation? So, again, like I, I, I explained with that example, it is um, we can use GANs for improving the image quality, image restoration, and segmentation. And so, this um, could definitely improve the, the quality of our techniques at the moment. How does one train a medical image scan when there is lack of ground truth images? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Yes, um, of course we do need data to train a gun, and that's you need to find a trade-off between um, how, like, usually. That's why recently we've been focusing a lot on using guns for generating data sets with privacy because. There, it, it can be that we have a lot of data, but this data cannot be shared. And so what we do is to generate a synthetic data that we can use um, to do data exploration, to do uh, for testing purposes, um, but it will be realistic because the GAN has been trained with a lot of data, right? Um, I hope this answers your question. Of course, it's very difficult to train again without enough data. And it's a good good question. Yes, and again, if you have few images to train with, how do you train guns? Um, same question, I guess. Um, how can I learn more about drawing pictures from the text? Is it something new or is it a well-known algorithm? I mean, I don't think there is anything really well known so far regarding synthetic data generation. Um, you can uh, dive text, uh, image to text, uh, sorry, text to image um, models, and you will find a lot of different GAN architectures that have been developed recently. Um, I think it is a really cool application, but I think that a lot of research still needs to be done on that direction. Okay, um, if you are interested in expanding training data, where you are interested in multiple labels, one, uh, can you still use GANs to do this? So do you mean a, um, like a data set with multiple labels? Can you do that? Yes, I um, like I was telling you about more research recently has been focused on um, using GANs for generating um, tabular data sets. Uh, I think that's what you're referring to. And so um, you can, in the same way that you generate an image that is representative of the real one, it actually has the same underlying data distributions, you could actually generate a tabular data set that is realistic, that's very similar to the real one. And so, of course, we could do this for um, data sets with um, two labels or three labels or multi-level data sets. Also, if there is anyone that wants to jump in and, and talk, I feel I'm just reading and answering, but um, I will continue. 
Um, so how to start with guns? Can you let me know the best way to start? Thank you very much and greetings from Mexico. Nice. Um, thank you. Thank you for your message. Uh, I do have um, some resources. Well, there are many links on these um, slides that um, I, I'm not sure now if this is recorded. I think so. But you can check those links to um, to check for me, no, more information. But in order to start with Gantt, I would strongly recommend you to a Coursera course that it's called, um, I think it's called Generative Adversarial Models or Introduction to Generative Adversarial Models. Um, this, is, um, this was built by deeplearning.ai. This was the first course that I did in order to start learning about synthetic data generation. So I really recommend it, it's really good. Are GANs a type of reinforcement learning? Um, no, I don't. I think that the um, base, basic models, I, I do see why you say that, because actually the, this is an adversarial process where two neural networks are trained against each other. But I think reinforcement learning, it's um, slightly different. How I see it is that GANs can help us find understand the underlying data distributions while reinforcement learning can help us optimize our models how do you choose the gun type try and error so first what i would do is to of course understand what data do you have so that's the first question if you have tabular data or if you have image data text data you will start with different architectures then you need to understand the architecture that you're using, of course. Um, if there are different architectures for the same tabular data, for the same type of data, um, of course, I, I would say trial and error. Um, read some papers to see what are the um, high, what are the models with the highest performance, and because you don't want to try all architectures that are out there, just like we do usually with any type of machine learning modeling and start from there. What kind of statistical analysis are you using for the synthetic data? Do you have special metrics to show its accuracy or compare different GAN approach results? Um, yeah, so I think, I hope it was clear what I, I was telling you about. I think the way that we assess the quality of the data sets is by comparing the distance between the real data set and the synthetic data set. And so you can use that there are many different quality metrics. There are many different distance metrics, but I would start basically by comparing means or standard deviation or any easy, like simple aggregate statistic and compare it between the real and the synthetic data set. And this will give you an uh, a big picture of the quality of the synthetic data set. Then you can dig um, more or deeper. There are different distance functions that you can use for um, calculating this, like the earth mover, moving distance or any others. And so, yes, um, I, I cannot tell you a specific one, um, but I would strongly recommend you to read about these more complex distance functions. And also, like I said, uh, I think it is very, very useful to use a machine learning model to compare the two data sets, uh, the performance with the two data sets, because this will give you a big, big um, um, feeling of the quality of the synthetic data set that you are, you've generated. Can GAN introduce additional biases when generating new data sets? Yes, th this is a really good question as well. We always need to use data sets with high variability. Without this, our machine learning models cannot learn from data that is not there. And so we do need variability in our data set to make sure that our GAN is able to generate data sets with enough variability. If we give the GAN data that is from the same population, it would only, will only learn to replicate this population and 
actually to accentuate the key features of this population. And that sometimes is dangerous. And so we need to make sure, we need to analyze our data sets. We need to be aware of what data we are using to train our models. And so if we use a data set that is, uh, that has enough variation, um, what the GAN will learn, should learn, is to generate data with a lot of variability. And then you can therefore see some variation in the data. So it's actually, if you train it with a good data set, you won't add biases, but you will add more variation to the data set. Are there any legal restrictions to use GANs generated medical data as it might be very similar to the original one? So yes, that's a big issue that we are encountering now. Of course, if like to generate the synthetic data, we need access to the real data, right? So if let's say a hospital has medical data, how can we generate synthetic data if they don't want to share it with us because it's a private data set? And so we have to solve this challenge in some way. And pharmaceutical companies, um, healthcare companies are trying, are actually starting to discuss about this. Um, but of course, uh, you cannot share this private data set. Maybe if this hospital could generate this synthetic data set, that could be a solution, right? Because if they generate it on their end, they could actually share it with us and make it open source or, or whatever. So yeah, we have to consider these legal restrictions. But if we are talking about data that is less sensitive, we can always use synthetic data set for data sets for the purpose that purposes that I shared. Okay, um, Arthur says, I'm confident that GANs will accelerate the generation of lifelike synthetic data. However, I'm very uneasy with the opposite problem to distinguish real versus synthetic data. Has your work given you a better insight on, on this opposite problem? Yes, um, that's, I think, as ML scientists, doesn't matter if we are playing with GANs or we are uh, using any other deep learning model uh, for predictive purposes or anything. Um, I think we have to be responsible. We have to use these tools responsibly. And um, we have to always uh, remember the ethics behind all these models. And with advances in ML and deep learning, um, this becomes more and more an issue because we are able to do things that we weren't able to do before. And so for example, this is one example, right? Um, we've heard a lot recently about deep fakes. Um, can we generate deep fakes with um, generative adversarial networks? I'm, I'm sure. Um, can we um, generate uh, an image that is very similar to, that has a very similar face to mine and actually end up generating something that resembles the real one? Yes, of course, I think, uh, but we have the responsibility to not do that. And, to be honest, also, it is a responsibility of the um, people that share this data and, for example, media and so on. And so there is a strong discussion on, on this topic. What type of similarity metrics used to evaluate the generate, the generate the synthetic data? Well, uh, like I said, I think this was the same um, question as before, but like I said, quality metrics, similarity metrics between the two data sets and machine learning performance. This is what I would go for. Hi, Marta. Hi, Daniel. That was a very nice presentation on the use of GANs. Thanks. I'm curious if you can comment on the difference between self-supervision methods and GANs. Um, well, I think they are different methods, right? Um, so self-supervision, I mean, I think the purpose of GANs is to generate a um, data set that resembles the real one, not for predicting. I mean, you cannot actually use generative networks, adversarial networks that are trained against each other to 
um, achieve a higher performance in predictive models. So that that's something that I could that we could check, but I I don't have much experience on this. I cannot tell you exactly. I will check though because it's interesting. Are there any medical applications that combines GAN with NLP? Um, so like I said, I think this would be really cool. Um, NLP, we find text data many times on medical files, for example. So, you know, you, you when you go to a doctor, you, you, you feel a paper or maybe the doctor um, writes his notes on paper. They, they still do that sometimes. And uh, so, of course, we need a lot of modeling um, and a lot of uh, data science um, process processing and, and data processing and so on to actually process this type of data in the medical domain. And so GANs could be really useful um, for, for example, for this data privacy topic that I was talking about. And so we can, if we want access to text data, but it's private and we cannot use it and we cannot share it because if it's private, can we generate a synthetic data set from text? That could be very interesting. And could actually accelerate research a lot. For a context, like and and now I'm thinking. Um, I also think it would be really cool. It's just a question of brainstorming, right? Um, as long as we have the architectures, we could actually think about really crazy ideas. So I, I'm thinking, um, could we actually by writing like in the same example, uh, the same example I shared with you, can we write um, a description of a medical image and actually get an example of this medical image? Like that could be really cool because Im medical images cannot be shared. This is something, one of the most private things, types of data that, that you can find. Can we actually generate these images for training purposes? That would be really interesting. For a context like recommender systems, the input matrix is a large and sparse. Do you have an idea whether GAN can handle this? Sparse means there are many zeros rather than values, and large matrix means more than 1,000 columns and 1,000 rows. So, okay, um, you are touching in uh, two, you are touching two topics. So, first of all, yes, we need high amounts of data to train GANs. Um, if not, they are not able to generate data with high quality, or maybe it will just um, replicate the data that it's seeing without making anything much different. Um, sparse. Um, that's the problem of unbalanced data sets. And so if we give a huge, even if it's a huge data set, but the features all look the same, the GAN is not able to, to learn from this data. And so probably I can imagine if we have many, many uh, zeros in our data set, the, um, the GAN will end up generating many zeros. Uh, which is something called mode, mode collapse. So mode collapse basically means that the GAN gets stuck in, in learning uh, one type of data that is usually more common in our data set and ends up generating this type of these characteristics all the time. So let's say if we have this um, data set full of zeros, it will end up generating a lot of zeros. And so it won't give us what we want, right? We want something that resembles the data that we have. And so this is also a problem, but it would also be a problem with any machine learning model, right? If we only have data that is zeros or is only from a specific um, distribution, um, it wouldn't be able to learn how to predict or how to classify. Is the Wasserstein GAN related to the Wasserstein distance? Yes, is the Wasserstein GAN is the GAN that uh, uses Wasserstein distance to learn how to make the real data set and the synthetic data set very close. And if they are very close, that means they 
are very similar and this synthetic data set resembles the original data set. And so what the GAN tries to do is to close this distance between the two data sets. And it has to use an optimizing function, right? And what Wasserstein GAN uses as an optimization function is Wasserstein distance. In some patients, medical image is used to generate synthetic data. If, oh, sorry, if some patient's medical image is used to generate synthetic data, should that patient be paid some royalty? Really, really interesting. And if you want to learn more about this, that's something called data valuation. And basically it talks about, should we pay um, people that are sharing the data um, something for their data. And so if businesses are, are earning X amount of money from these data insights, should we be paying those data, those, those people, something for this? And that's a really interesting discussion. I cannot give you a, a, an answer, um, but I really, really strongly recommend you to read about it and let me know. <laughs> For the Wasserstein GAN, the Lipschitz Lipsi condition must be satisfied. Hence, there is an additional part called white clipping, which increases the computational cost. Can we avoid white clipping? Um, good question. Can we avoid white clipping? I mean, the problem with um, it is very interesting to avoid white clipping. One of the risks of using white clipping is that actually we end up having mode collapse. And so basically generating the same, um, since we are um, reducing, we're, we're clipping the gradients, we will end up producing the same, um, the same outputs, such as with mode collapse. And so it would be interesting to avoid, avoid weight clipping, but I think that's the thing that you use to satisfy Lipschitz condition. Sorry, I, I, it's difficult to pronounce. <laughs> um, and so this is how Wasserstein Gain is, is, is like, is, this, this is the architecture of Wasserstein Gain. And it needs that to avoid mode collapse. We can check new architectures that try to avoid this. That was great. Mm -hmm. Gracias, Marta. I, I hope I'm saying right. Yes, yes, yes. Gracias. <laughs> okay, that, that's great. Uh, so it was a fantastic pre presentation. You guys can find a presentation on YouTube. So I appreciate all your time and Marta for your great presentation. Hope to see you in our future events. Thank you. Thank you all for your messages and thank you for the opportunity of being here. It was fun. Really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you.